Well, good evening, everyone. I want to welcome each and every one of you to our Christmas Eve candlelight service. Thank you for being here. And I trust and pray that you'll be blessed uh, by our gathering tonight. Isn't this a very special night? Yes. It's always so wonderful. The, the night before Christmas, our hearts are full with anticipation about the celebration of Jesus' birth. And it's right that we would take time out tonight to gather as the people of God and just to celebrate his birth with one another. So again, a very warm welcome to you. Uh, just a couple of uh, announcements to make. Uh, the first is that following this service, there'll be some refreshments in the back if you want to stay around just for a little while to have something to eat with us. But then the second one, very important, is that we have decided to take our Sunday morning service online. It will be virtual only, so we won't meet here in the building on Sunday morning. Instead, we'll meet via Zoom. And the link and the details for how to do that will be on our Facebook page, both the internal and external page, and on Church uh, Connect as well. In light of um, all that's going on with the surge in COVID cases and the fact that many of us will be in groups of people tomorrow celebrating, we decided to just go online this Sunday morning. So don't come to the building on Sunday. You'll be very lonely if you come. <laughs> But glad that you're here tonight, and we just want to begin our service with a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for this time of year, what this season means. And we understand, dear God, that Jesus is the reason for the season. Christmas is about the celebration of his birth, and we thank you for that. We thank you for who Jesus is and what he means to us. Thank you for what he has done in our lives and, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to tell his story once again. Father, we are so appreciative of everyone who is here, whether in the building or watching online. And we just pray that you'd bless each and every one. So bless our time together, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I'm going to invite uh, my daughter Brandy, if she'll come forward with our Advent reading. And Simon, he's going to come and light the candles for us. We light our final Advent candle, the center candle, which represents Christ. We celebrate our newborn King and we anticipate his marvelous return, Christ the Anointed One. Jesus, the light of the world, has come and is coming again in full glory. In Christ, Jesus took on flesh and dwelt among us. Prepare, for he is soon to come again. We have cause to celebrate because the grace of God has appeared, offering the gift of salvation to all people. Grace arrives with its own instruction, run away from anything that leads us away from God, abandon the lust and the passions of this world. Live life now in this age with awareness and self-control, doing the right thing and keeping yourselves holy. Watch for his return. Expect the blessed hope we all will share when our great God and Savior, Jesus, the Anointed One, appears again. He gave his body for our sakes and will not only bless us free, I'm sorry, break us free from the chains of wickedness, but he will also prepare a community uncorrupted by the world that he will call his own, people who are passionate about doing the right thing. Titus 2, 11 through 14. We thank you, God, for loving us and sending us your son, that we might be saved. Father, we are forever grateful.
angels we have heard on high sweetly singing o oh, e the plains and the mountains in reply echoing their joyous strain gloria in excelsis d e Shepherds, why this jubilee? Why your joyous strains prolong? What the gladsome tidings be, which inspire your every song? Gloria in excelsis. the Lord, the newborn King. Gloria in e x c e l s i s d e In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, "Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you." Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, 
and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, 
And you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home and his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. story of Christmas, Jesus is born. This is Mary. Hi! You see, Mary was the mother of Jesus, but before that happened, she lived in the town of Nazareth, and she was engaged to marry a man named Joseph. Hello. Hi, Joseph! Oh, God. Mary got pregnant by the power of God. Hey, huh? Joseph didn't understand all this at first, but an angel came and told him to still take Mary as his wife. Yeah, okay. So he did as the angel said. Not long after that, the ruler of the land, Caesar Augustus, wanted to count how many people were in the land. So Caesar Augustus ordered everyone in the land to travel back to their hometowns so that they could be counted. Joseph's hometown was Bethlehem, so Mary and Joseph traveled from Nazareth all the way to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, they looked for a place to stay. No, I'm sorry. Oh, man. But there was no room for them. Uh, what about her? Um, okay. So they stayed in a barn, and while they were there, Mary gave birth to Jesus. Whoa. <laughs> she wrapped him snugly in the strips of cloth uh, that'll work. and laid him in a manger. Excuse me. And so the Son of God, the Savior of the world, was born in a barn in Bethlehem. <laughs>
In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angels, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning all that they had been told about this child. And all who heard were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Amen.
Amen. <laughs> Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. When Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, of incense, and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Tonight, we've taken the time to read all of the New Testament narratives on the birth of Jesus. The passages that were read tonight were written by two individuals, Matthew, who was one of the original disciples of Jesus, and Luke, who was not. Luke was a doctor and a companion to the Apostle Paul. And his account of the birth of Jesus is largely drawn from the experience of Mary, and most historians believe that Mary was the source of his information. Almost all of what we know about the birth of Jesus comes from Matthew and Luke. Essentially, what both men write is a story. A story told from the perspective of several different individuals and groups of people. It's a very familiar story. Most of us first heard it in childhood and have heard it dozens of times since then. Some have called it the greatest story ever told. And they are right. It is the greatest story ever told. But it's more than that. It is also the most important story ever told. Most stories are written to inform or to inspire or to entertain. However, this story is written to change your life and your eternal destiny. The Bible calls this story the gospel. And the word gospel comes from the Greek, and it means good news. This story is told so that you can know how to have your sins forgiven and how to begin a relationship with God. It is told so that you can know how to experience freedom from whatever sins and vices have you bound. It is told so that you can learn how to experience God's peace and his joy and his hope. And it is also told so that you can learn how you can be absolutely assured that when you leave this earth, you'll spend all of eternity in heaven with God. That's what makes this good news. In the text we read, we read about the first people to hear this story. And we also heard their reaction to hearing it. It begins with this young girl named Mary who learns from the angel Gabriel, that she has been chosen to have God's son. Let that sink in for a moment. Imagine yourself, 16 or 17-year-old young lady, engaged to be married, and an angel tells you that God has chosen you to have his son. Joseph was the next to hear this story. An angel appeared to Joseph and informed him that the child his fiancée was carrying had been conceived by the Holy Spirit. Joseph had already known or discovered 
that Mary was pregnant. And because he cared for her, he had decided to end the engagement and to put her aside quietly as not to draw attention to her pregnancy. However, after hearing what the angel had said, Joseph too complied with the angel's instructions and he went ahead and married Mary and took her as his wife. After Jesus was born, some shepherds who were watching over their flock at night were the next people to hear this incredible story. They were out there in the field one night and suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared to them. The Bible tells us that initially they were frightened. One translation says they were so afraid <laughs> because they didn't know what to make of this. But the angel immediately told them that they had nothing to fear and that instead they brought good news of great joy. And the angel declared to them that a savior had been born. Immediately after hearing this news, the shepherds hurried off to find the child and they found him exactly where the angel said he was. And then lastly, we heard about some wise men from the east who upon seeing this special star in the sky recognized it as a sign of the birth of the king of the Jews. And these men set out a long distance to go and find this child and it brought them to Jerusalem where they inquired where the child was. When King Herod, who was king at the time, heard about their visit, he was not happy. The Bible says that he and all Jerusalem with him were distressed about the news that this child had been born. Herod then secretly arranged for the wise men to meet him. And he pretended to want to know where the child was so that he too could worship the child. And so he told the wise men, when you find him, come back and tell me where he is. The wise men then go off and they do find Jesus. And when they find him, they worshiped him and they presented him with gifts worthy of a king. After being warned by an angel not to tell King Herod where the child was, they went back home another route without informing Herod. All of these accounts are the accounts of a diverse group of people who first hear about Jesus' impending birth and then hear that he had been born. And they all had different responses to the news. Mary, Joseph, the shepherds and the wise men all celebrated his birth. King Herod and many in Jerusalem, they had a very different reaction. You know, this story is still being told. And it's been one of our intentions at this season of Christmas to make sure that this story is told clearly once again. Although every day, in fact, all over the world, someone hears this story. Some people hear it for the very first time. Others, it is a story they have heard many, many times before. And just like those in the Bible, there are different responses to this story. Some hear this story and believe it is true, and their lives are forever changed. Others hear this story, and although respectful of it, they may even find it interesting or fascinating but they don't believe it has anything to do with their life. And still others don't believe it at all. You've heard the story tonight. Perhaps someone has heard it for the very first time, but I doubt that. Most of us have heard it many, many times before. You've heard again tonight the story of how God sent his one and only son, Jesus, into the world in the person of Jesus Christ. You've heard how he was born of a virgin and placed in a manger in a stable in Bethlehem. You've heard how he was named Jesus because he came to save us from our sins. Jesus is God's gift to the world. This story, however, is not told just to inform you or to entertain you or to even inspire you. The Bible says that this story is told so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You see, the Bible says that we all have sinned 
and have failed to live up to God's expectations of us when he created us. And because of our sinfulness, God couldn't have the relationship with us that he created us to have. But instead of giving up on us as humanity, God showed us just how much he loved us. And he did so by sending his one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he did die on the cross and that on the third day God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you believe this story, your life will be changed. Your sins will be forgiven. Doesn't matter about what you've done in the past. And sins aren't just the bad things we do. It's really an attitude of heart. Every human being is susceptible to the same temptation. We just manifest it in different ways. And the core temptation that we all have to battle against is the temptation to be God in our own life. To not acknowledge that we are here, not just because our parents got together or through some accident of nature, but that God created each and every one of us. And that he has a unique and special purpose for each and every one of our lives. And that as our creator, we owe him our love and our allegiance and our obedience. And the great temptation that humanity has is to believe that we are our own God, that we can do our own thing. We may even feel like because we're a good person and we don't harm anybody and we treat everybody right and, you know, we've never done anything bad in our life and all of the other things we might say and feel about ourselves, especially when we compare ourselves to other people and say we're nothing like those people, we may feel like we're okay. But God's story says something different. It says that we were all lost and on our way to eternal damnation. But God loved us so much that he made a way for us to have our sins forgiven and our relationship with God restored. So that even as we live in this life day by day, we don't live alone, that we have this ever-abiding sense of his presence, knowing that God is with us, that he's directing our lives, that he has a special purpose and plan for our life, and that real happiness and fulfillment and contentment in life comes not from wealth or fame or power, but for knowing that you are living your life for the purpose God put you on this earth. There's nothing better in this world than having a relationship with God right now. If you would believe that this story, the story that many of you have heard over and over and over again is true, you can experience freedom from whatever it is that has you bound in life. If you've ever felt like you didn't like yourself or didn't like the things you're involved in, if you ever wish that you could wipe the slate clean and start all over again. If there is this emptiness and this longing inside and desire to, to be something different or live a different life, you can find that in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. If you would confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that the story of Christmas is true. If you believe in this story, you can experience God's peace. And I'm not just talking about happiness, because that's an emotion that comes based on what's going on in our life. But you can have this deep-seated assurance at the very core of your be being that all is well with you and your relationship with God. And that no matter what comes against you, God is working everything out for your good. You can experience God's joy. That amazing joy that we were talking about, re excuse me, singing about earlier. And you can have a hope, a hope that will help you to get through whatever difficult days that you have in this life. And we all have them. But then ultimately, a hope that one day, when you draw your last breath in this life, you will spend all of eternity in heaven with God. I want to suggest to you, and even more than suggest to you, but really impress upon you, that although you've heard this story over and over again, Take some time to really reflect on what is your response to it. Do you believe it with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Has this story changed your life? Do you have a relationship with God? 
Are you experiencing life at its best because you're living it for him? Or has your reaction to it been to be respectful of it, maybe to find it interesting and intriguing, but not really relevant for your own life? Or have you rejected it? The Bible tells us that everything in our life depends on our response to the greatest story ever told. Please don't let this just be an interesting story about a baby in a manger or about some shepherds in the field or some wise men from the east. Put your faith in Jesus Christ tonight. Allow him to be the Lord of your life and experience not just the meaning, but the privilege and the power of Christmas in your own life. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads with me as I close in prayer? Dear God, I thank you so very much for allowing us to once again to hear and reflect on your story. The story of how Jesus Christ came to earth is an incredible story. That you loved us so much that you sent your one and only son to this earth as a human being. And even more than that, as a baby born in a manger, he didn't come with great fanfare and acclaim. There wasn't, um, the, the, the world didn't roll out the red carpet for him. He came humbly, took on the role of a servant. Thank you that Jesus was obedient to you, even obedient to dying on the cross for our sins. And thank you, dear God, that you have designed a plan of salvation for us, that if we just put our faith in your son, Jesus Christ, really believe it so that it changes our life, thank you, dear God, that we can have a relationship with you that begins in this life but continues throughout all of eternity. Father, I thank you for everyone who is here and those who are watching online, everyone under the sound of my voice. And I pray, dear God, that you would take these words that I have spoken and the scriptures that have been read and use them to minister to the hearts and minds of everyone who is listening and help them to hear you speaking, calling them into relationship with you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, that nearly concludes our service to, for tonight, and I, again, want to just thank each and every one of you for taking the time to come out tonight, and for those of you who are watching online, thank you uh, for the privilege of your time. I know that you could have been many other places tonight, but you chose to come and worship with us, and we really do appreciate it. I do hope you've been blessed by being here tonight. And then the final thing we want to do is to gather around the perimeter of the sanctuary, each of you should have received a, uh, I'm sorry, oh, yes, the children, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. It's so dark out there, I can't see you at all, Harley, so I <laughs> forgot about the children. Yeah, the children have a, um, a special thing they're going to come. You know, Peggy, I was wondering, why is it only 6.50 and I'm nearly done? <laughs> I'm ahead of schedule. But that's why, because I'm forgetting something. Yeah, children, when you come up forward, they're going to present us with one of the songs they did this past Sunday in the children's program that we so loved and so blessed by. So let's just give them a, a round of encouragement as they come. want to just all maybe come over on this side. Can everybody see well mm -hmm. then? Okay. There we go. By an overwhelming vote, this was the song that they chose. So um, clearly they liked it too, but I thought you might, if you didn't get to see the program, might want to know that it's a song from the innkeeper and his wife's perspective. If I knew then what I know If I knew then what I know now 
things would be different somehow. I gladly offered him the best that I could give. If only I knew then what I know now. Thank you guys so very much for that. And as we draw our service and our time here tonight to a close, I'm going to invite everyone, hopefully everyone has your candle, and if we can just make a circle around the perimeter of the sanctuary, we will light our candles and then sing together Silent Night before we leave. If you don't have a candle, there's some at the back table there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he stole mine. <laughs> okay. Can I light yours? You just light your candle and pass it around. In turn, we'll wait till everyone, everyone's candle is lit. Hey, Scott, those on this side, could they come around a little bit more? Yeah, we'll fill it in. Yeah. You, can, you, you guys can slide over just a bit, too, a couple of steps. Yeah, there we go. Make sure everybody can fit there. Thank you.
If anybody catches fire, just remember to stop, drop, and roll. Okay, I think we have everyone now. <clears throat> Barbara, are you, are you able to uh, start us off, put us in the right key? Because if I do it, everybody's going to be two octaves too low. One to wish to eat and drink. 
one of you a very Merry Christmas. Hope you have a great time with your family and friends, and God bless you. Amen.